This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Hi, I'm Mark Jurgensmeyer, Director of the Orfila Center for Global and International Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And today we have with us really quite a remarkable person, Professor Ananya Roy from Berkeley, uh, is a professor in city regional pan uh, planning in, uh, at Berkeley, but also uh, holds a distinguished chair in global poverty. And she's become known throughout the country now as kind of the go-to person in thinking not only about issues of of global of inequity in this country, but global inequity and how poverty is a problem not just for people who have to experience it, but for all of us. Many of us have seen her TED Talks, uh, her recent YouTube uh, uh, animated uh, portrayal of issues on welfare has gone viral. Ananya Roy, it is such a pleasure to see you and to welcome you to Santa Barbara. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Great. And the first question I want to ask is that I, I, knew you, I knew you were born in Kolkata and then you came to Mills College and then to UC Santa Barbara. And, you know, with all due respect, Mills College and Berkeley, uh, UC uh, uh, Berkeley, they're pretty privileged places. So I guess the first question is how does a person of the kind of relative privilege that you and I enjoy, certainly compared with, you know, 95% of the rest of the world's population. How do you get passionate about an issue that in some ways doesn't really directly affect you? Mm -hmm. Well, I did grow up in Kolkata, India, and I grew up in a middle class household where I, I think encounters with poverty were present but limited. Meaning you would see people on the street, you would see people working in the house, but but for the most part, one lived in a particular middle-class privileged bubble. Right. One went to school on a school bus, wore a crisp white uniform, came back home to a lovely meal, um, and had the ability to get a wonderful education. Mm. And so I moved to the US um, on my own at 18. I realized it took me a few years to recognize that I'm an immigrant. <laughs> uh, and, but in that journey, I think... In, all of us are immigrants in the United States. Yes, Most of us don't yes, realize it, but we are. Yes, but as my <laughs> niece and nephew point out, I'm um, fresh off the boat, all right? right? <laughs> um, but I think that journey, that displacement of moving from one part of the world to the other, mm. as it does for many immigrants, as it does for many members of the diaspora, mm. forced a particular sort of reflection. Mm. And you know, Mills College is its own um, privileged world as well, this beautiful gated campus Lovely. in the midst of great poverty mm. in, in a city in which I continue to live, Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. That's true. And I think that being at Mills, particularly in some amazing courses in sociology mm -hmm. at Mills, with some wonderful urban sociologists, I was often asked to reflect on Kolkata. Mm -hmm. And when I reflected, I found myself returning persistently to the themes of poverty and inequality. Mm -hmm. And those became the enduring interests for my research and teaching. Well, of course, uh Poverty exists everywhere, and often in the United States we think of it in terms of rural poverty uh, in Appalachia, and this is mm -hmm. also true around the world. I mean, you come at this from urban studies and the study of global cities. Do you think, that, think there's something distinctive about the emergence of global cities that creates a, a special kind of problem in, in terms of poverty and, and, and economic inequality? That's a great question because in some ways one can think about urban poverty as simply rural poverty moved to the city. Right. And yet I think... All those people sleeping on the uh, sidewalks right. in Delhi that's and right. Kolkata, they right. actually come from a village somewhere. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. And that is true. Mm -hmm. And yet I think there's an experience and politics to urban poverty that is important. Mm -hmm. So in the Indian context and elsewhere, I study the making of what is often called a world-class city. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no good def definition of a world-class city. A world-class city is really what every other world-class city is. Mm -hmm. But it's precisely cities as mm -hmm. nodes of economic globalization. Mm -hmm. And those cities are very interesting because they rely 
on this massive, cheap labor force. Mm -hmm. Give us of, some examples. So, mm -hmm. for example, those who build the city mm -hmm. are, in fact, often informalized, casualized workers mm -hmm. who are living in squatter settlements who would never be able to afford formal housing. Right. Those who clean the city, those who raise its children, cook its meals. So in fact, we know that the urban majority of these cities mm -hmm. is made up of, of the poor. Mm -hmm. And yet... And the cities are dependent on them. They're dependent on them, and mm -hmm. yet world-class cities reject the presence of mm -hmm. the urban majority, mm -hmm. that the making of the world-class city is about displacing, marginalizing, making invisible the poor, be it the vast slum demolitions that we have seen, be it particular forms of gentrification, be it the clean-up campaigns of these cities. So in the name of the making of the world-class city, we've seen repeated attempts to do away with the urban, major urban majority, but the irony is hmm. that the world class city of the global city depends, hmm. as you point out, right, on these. Right, but you can make the cynical argument <laughs> that, that, the, that the wealth, the prosperity, everything we think of as shining and distinctive about these world class global cities, as you say, rely upon mm -hmm. this really cheap labor. And the cynical argument is, yeah, well, the poor we always have with us. What's the problem with that? Well, of course. But I think the puzzle has been that economic growth in many parts of the global south, India being an example, has not necessarily made a dent in poverty. So what we're seeing mm -hmm. is the coexistence of economic growth and the expansion of prosperity for certain social classes, along with the persistence of, and some would argue, the deepening of poverty and inequality. Mm -hmm. And that simultaneity um, is something for us to consider, but it also makes for a particular sort of politics. And I think what we're seeing around the world is the re-emergence of poor people's movements that are calling into question that, that inequality. Well, now you're, now you're coming into a point, I think, that's really interesting and important. And I thought about it when I was looking at your, your, your new uh, YouTube uh, video, which mm -hmm. is just stunning because you don't appear on camera at all in that video that's right you're just the uh, narrative voice but it's this imaginative animated drawings that really just you know are so gripping to watch uh, but they make the point in such a real way and it's all about welfare of mm -hmm. course it's gone viral mm -hmm. 400,000 hits I think you were telling me yes yes yeah so uh, it, it's gone viral I think not just because of the style of it but by the message and the me message is that the idea of welfare <sighs> We need to look at what we mean by that and who is being benefited by the kind of government programs. It's not always poor people. It's often very rich people and oil companies. And, and then you make the point that the, the issue of inequity is a problem for all of us. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'd really like to to get to explore with you because a lot of us say, oh, yes, it's so well poor, these poor people. Yes, we are concerned about them. But after all, it doesn't really affect us. But you say it does affect us. That's right. Mm. So I think that in, in the work we've been doing on global poverty at UC mm. Berkeley, our emphasis has not been so much on the global poor as a category. In mm. fact, Nancy Fraser has a wonderful piece where she says that that's a deeply problematic category, mm -hmm. that she prefers the term transnational precariat to point out the relationships of impoverishment mm -hmm. that produce poverty. Uh -huh. But I'd like us to go further in moving from asking how can we help the poor to asking how is poverty produced, to asking how are wealth, power, and privilege produced. Mm -hmm. Because when we get to that last set of questions, then we are adopting what my colleagues at UW Seattle, Vicki Lawson and Sarah Elwood, are talking about as a relational understanding of poverty. That we Which may, then of does affect us. That is mm -hmm. about us. Mm -hmm. That right. it's about our dependencies mm -hmm. on the labor of the poor. Right. It's mm -hmm. on and our, what it does to us as well. Exactly. As it's about how we think of ourselves, our place in the right, world. Right, right. Right. It's what, how millennials think of their place in the world in relation to the poor. Mm -hmm. So how do we think about the poor and how we other the poor? Mm -hmm. But also how asking those questions allows us to think about how our lives are constructed, how our privileges mm 
are constructed mm -hmm. and maintained. Mm -hmm. When you grew up in India, and I, I you know, Confession, I lived in India for several yes. years, so I have, I have a sense of what this is like. When you live in India, you grow up with servants. You see them all around you, and you, you have a direct sense of your dependency on, on servants, for good or for evil. And I have to say, as like a democratic American, it was very uncomfortably mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. at first when I, when I lived mm -hmm. in Chandigarh in Punjab mm -hmm. uh, to in my, set up my household, and I, I didn't want to have any servants. And then the neighbors came to me and said, oh, Sahab, you said, you are, you are so greedy. You know, you, wh why are you denying these poor people some money? All they want to do is clean your house for a small amount of money. Yes. And I suddenly realized yeah. that they saw themselves as integrally related, my neighbors, with the economy mm -hmm. that was helping people and nourishing them. Uh, and, but you could see that in India. In the United States, we don't see the servants we really have. I mean, we have all kinds of servants. We, have, we rely on the poor, as you say, in so many different ways. But we don't, because we don't see them, we have no way of, way of interacting or seeing that our lives are dependent on them. Is that part of the problem? That is part of the mm -hmm. problem. So I'm always fascinated that we have a generation of millennials, mm -hmm. the undergraduates, say, in our mm -hmm. classrooms, all through the UC system, passionate about mm. poverty action. Mm. And at least my students at Berkeley, I think initially as they come to the topic of poverty action, are very eager to act on poverty elsewhere. Uh -huh. But it takes them a while mm. to think about poverty in their own backyards so that their encounters with poverty make in, in the US, say in the lovely liberal city of Berkeley, right. uh, where we have a substantial homeless population, right. those encounters for them are deeply discomforting and troubling. Mm -hmm. because it doesn't fit into the format of dealing with poor others elsewhere. So how do you handle this in the classroom? How do you, how do you maybe uh, take this passion or these mm -hmm. concerns and, and help to redirect it, shape it, give it this overused term agency, give it a sense of empowerment for students so they can, they can experience these ideas in the classroom and then make, make a difference in the world? How, how do you do that? What, as a teacher, I know the problem, and right, I'm just curious right. how, how you do because your classes are famous. I mean, you teach some of the largest classes at Berkeley. Well, I mm -hmm. think that the approach has been to think about what it means to exist at this historical moment and what it means to think of a global world. And that means thinking about the so-called global south, the former third world, whatever we're going to call it, mm -hmm. in relation to this other place, which is the North Atlantic. And I think that, um, of course, we exist at a time of sustained economic and social crisis in the North Atlantic, including in California. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all experienced uh, the hardships of the tremendous budget crisis in the University of California system, for example. And so I think that precisely that moment of great economic inequality and vulnerability in the North Atlantic, in, in the US, for example, provides an opportunity to think relationally, to think of ourselves here in the US not as exceptional, mm -hmm. but in fact as deeply interconnected with the world, and to recognize the ways in which what once seemed to be a stable, middle-class American life from which one could embark on projects of charity or volunteerism mm -hmm. or humanitarianism is being eroded. Mm -hmm. And if so, can we move from the practice of charity, of saving the poor, to a new project of solidarity? And how, that's, that sounds a bit abstract, in the, that I'm, I'm sitting here as a student, hearing this thing, yeah, this is, this is good. How, then how, does, how do you help st the student make the connection between these kind of larger ideas and what they, in fact, do think relate in their lives when they leave the classroom. So one key aspect of this is thinking concretely about poverty and inequality in the US uh -huh. and what it means for us to act upon it and to understand poverty and inequality in the US as happening alongside and entangled with poverty and inequality elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the context of California, that if we are to think about food systems, we think, of course, about low wage workers mm -hmm. in plantation economies in the global south, but equally of the Central Valley. Right? And how do we think about the long history of agricultural work? Mm -hmm. Or if we are to think about servitude and how we are served, that yes, being in India, 
where one is often served by domestic workers is one particular experience, but in fact it runs parallel to all of the, as you point out, invisible workers mm -hmm. who serve us in, in some of the most low paid occupations here in the US. Right, right. But I think the other part of it, uh, the, we have a rather um, jargon laden motto uh, mm. for our program at Berkeley. It's, mm. it's, it's, a, it's a phrase I like to say at the beginning of class and I realize that we've come to repeat it over time and so have our students. That I think at the end of the day, um, there's no right way of doing this. That we have mm. to constantly learn about the world, but we have to unlearn our privilege. Mm -hmm. So in class we talk about how we're trying to find a space between two extremes. That on the one hand, we have the hubris of benevolence, mm -hmm. that we think we can solve a poor community's problems during a spring break mm -hmm. or a summer service learning trip. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, is do they do that? By the way, I mean, do they go off and? Well, they do. We send mm. them on practice, but we mm. don't. We don't ever l let them leave uh, with the impression mm. that they're going to go out and solve, solve the a problem world, in right. a spring break. <laughs> right. um, but on the other hand, is the paralysis of cynicism. Yeah. That I think all of us know how to critique programs and policies and institutions, mm -hmm. but what then? Mm -hmm. And that space in between is a very complicated space. It's a compromised space. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a space of innocence. Mm -hmm. But how do we occupy that space and act? And so I think it means figuring out the programs and pr movements and policies that we want to ally ourselves with, mm -hmm. however imperfect they may be. Mm -hmm. And to do that labor mm -hmm. of getting some things done, recognizing that it's not going to be perfect. So you encourage them to be involved in some way and relate this to the chorus? Well, in, in the program we run at Berkeley, um, in the undergraduate minor in global poverty and practice, each Which is a big minor, by the way. It's a big minor, yeah. with over 400 students at any given time. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Each student is required to conceptualize and complete a practice experience. Mm -hmm. But that practice like experience what? can be anything from mm -hmm. working with the social movement. So mm -hmm. working with, say, the MST in Brazil, mm -hmm to working, say, with um, a policy advocacy organization in Washington, D.C., to working with organizations that are assisting immigrants in Oakland, California, poor immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so it's for students to figure out what sort of transformative work they want to do, but recognizing that that work will actually transform them. Mm -hmm. And because it's a minor, one third of our students actually come from the sciences. I see. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. They're, you know, the, the students are going to go on to be engineers and doctors and environmental scientists. Right. And these are many of the professions at the front lines uh -huh. today of poverty action. And so it's really about asking them to think about how they're going to be a different kind of engineer, mm -hmm. a different type of doctor, and how they're going to face up to the ethical dilemmas mm -hmm. associated with poverty action. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you like your students. I mean, I, I, yes. a, a mark of a good teacher is always <laughs> not to love your subject and love your subjects. <laughs> you know, love your, what you're yes. talking about, and also love the the, the, the students who are, who are studying with you. But w what do you do? I, you're famous as a mesmerizing teacher, and I've seen your TED talks, and I know that you're a great public speaker. But is that it basically, or is there something different you do in the classroom? Is there a? Are you? Have you tried to create? a different kind of classroom experience than the usual, here's the lecture standing at the podium and here we are kind of imbibing what she says? Well, I think the first thing, and you know this, um, in, 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 in the ways in which the Global Studies program here at UC Santa Barbara mm -hmm. has grown up, that I think that the hallmark of our undergraduate programs in the UC system is that we lead with, with research. That I think it's the research we do Mm -hmm. that, that creates mm -hmm. the content of what we teach. And so for me, that link between research and teaching is crucial. So you talk crucial. about what you do. Yeah. Right? And I think that the, the methodologies and analytical frameworks that we use for research have to be imparted to our undergraduates, but they have to be participants in it. So I think the first thing I do is treat my undergraduates as scholars. Mm -hmm. We start the class by reading um, a piece by Subcomandante Marcos um, called Ideas From Are the Also Weapons. Yes, yeah. Ideas Are Also Weapons. Mm -hmm. Written at the, at the height of the Zapatista movement, 
written for a global audience and arguing that the world does change through ideas. Right. And I want, so the first thing I bring to the classroom, but it's something I keep in mind as a researcher, recognizing the public mission mm -hmm. of our university, mm -hmm. is um, that our ideas have an impact, we are responsible for our ideas, and that in fact, we belong to a very powerful knowledge producing institution. Mm -hmm. And it's not just we as faculty, mm -hmm. but so do our students. So that's perhaps the first thing I want to always mm -hmm. impart to, our stu to my students and want them to believe and act on. Mm -hmm. And you know, the second I think is really having them think in creative open ways about these ideas that they're, that I want them to be participants in the very fierce debates mm -hmm. that are being waged about poverty and inequality and welfare. Mm -hmm. That they don't have to be in agreement with any mm -hmm. one set of ideas, right. but they have to be able to hold their own in those debates, and more importantly, they have to know what's at stake in those debates, mm -hmm. and there's quite a bit at stake. Mm -hmm. now, I know you've used film and you use a lot of visuals, and uh, you're telling me you use Twitter in the classroom. Tell Explain that. That's I've never heard anybody who's used Twitter in the classroom. How does that work? Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a purist as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I've refused to sign up to the whole online learning thing <laughs> because I've been uncomfortable with the idea of... You're never going to produce a MOOC. I'm not going to do a MOOC, <laughs> and I think... That These are the, massive online courses that uh, have gained such notoriety in recent years. That's right. And, mm -hmm. and you know, as you know, part of the problem with MOOCs is the data tells us that less than 5% of students enrolling for these MOOCs complete those right. courses. Right, right. Right, so yeah. I think they're wonderful as a format for getting out, for the public dissemination of information. Mm -hmm. As a teacher, I'm not sure that they allow us to teach. Right. Um, so so you want to interact with your students. Yes. Yeah. I want to go through mm -hmm. the very deliberate and dialogical process of teaching and learning. With seven, in a you classroom. have 700 students in your classroom. But How it's can still you dialogue a classroom. with 700 students? It's still a classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a magic to the classroom. The classroom is a very particular sort of space. Mm -hmm. And what that means for me, of course, is that we build through the course of the semester. These are not individual lectures that they show up to, to mm -hmm. hear. It's not entertainment. Mm -hmm. And right. that the conversation has to continue. Mm -hmm. Over time, we build trust. Mm -hmm. We build a shared vocabulary. And strangely, um, certain forms of social and digital media mm -hmm. have allowed me to, I think, extend that work. Mm -hmm. I turn to Twitter because precisely in a classroom of 720 students, it's difficult to have an interactive format. Mm -hmm. I love walking around my classroom and asking questions. But you know, it's mm -hmm. usually about 20 students, and often the same 20 students who will raise their hand and answer. Sure. Okay. So the experiment with Twitter was that in some class sessions where we were going to have lively debate, right. and hopefully lively debate, where yeah, people yeah. were going to disagree with each other and disagree with what we'd read, right. that we would be able to run a live Twitter feed. Students would tweet to a hashtag, so the students, they, they, they get out their, their smartphone. Right. <laughs> or their laptop, and they can tweet. Uh, yeah, and they just and it agree. shows up. Right, and it immediately shows up on the screen. It shows up, and I'm still walking around the room, and, and if people hate Twitter, particularly given the gentrifying effects of Twitter on the city of San Francisco, yeah. Twitter uh, as a company, um, <laughs> they can they can simply answer the old-fashioned way, raise right. their hands and, and talk in right. class. But the students are seeing a whole stream of questions They're and seeing, comments, so there's an immediate kind of class participation that everybody can see up on the right. board while, while you're talking. That's right. How and so one of the first tweets, I think, was, was all, has always been each year that I do this, from students who say, I would have never spoken up in a classroom of 700 students. Uh -huh. But I can now tweet. Right. But students can also disagree with each other on Twitter. They can mm -hmm. go back to that Twitter mm -hmm. feed. And what I or disagree do, with you. And dis and and they disagree vigorously. Because they're anonymous on, you're on anonymous. Twitter. You're anonymous. Yeah. They can be snarky. They can say <laughs> what's on their mind, even if it's the party they're going to have that weekend, <laughs> which is all right. Since it's on their mind, they might as well right. say you it. You don't have to dwell on that. It just right? zooms past on the Twitter um, feed. But what I also <laughs> love is that <laughs> the conversations continue well after the class has ended. Mm -hmm. 
And so students post um, material, usually on Sunday mm. night, the mm -hmm. Twitter feed lights up because they're all doing their readings uh -huh. and they're commenting on readings and posting other material. Right, right. But also I have the opportunity usually after that class session has ended to go into the Twitter feed and there are usually hundreds of tweets okay. and I usually produce a summary, a, my curated summary, it's a uh -huh. curation. Right. But it allows me to curate the discussion and record it in a way that I can't otherwise do. Uh -huh. with classroom discussion. Right. So do you, I, I'm going to steal this idea, it's such a great idea. I, I would love that. <laughs> but do you, do you devote like a, a certain section of the last part of your lecture just for the, the Twitter feeds or do you allow it to go on throughout the whole lecture? I only do it for sessions that um, where where there is the opportunity for debate. So I don't do it in every class session. I see. So I'll give you an example. With um, a class on global poverty, you can imagine that one of our first sessions in the semester is the great Jeffrey Sachs, William Easterly debate. Mm -hmm you know, the New York showdown, if you will. Yeah. And so they read excerpts from Sachs's book and Easterly's book. Mm -hmm. And not surprisingly, this is a generation that sides with Easterly mm -hmm. and are very seduced. Do you show clips of them ideas. also talking about this? Or is it well, at times I do. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, so what the Twitter feed allows us to do is to, in fact, debate these ideas. Mm -hmm because there is a very specific debate here. Right, mm -hmm. and sides can be taken and yes. people can get involved yes. in it. <laughs> but you know, sometimes when I've used more humanistic material, so right. for example, we read from Marshall Berman's All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, right. where he discuss, discusses Baudelaire's poetry. Right. And you know, how, there, how poets like Baudelaire were writing about encounters with poverty in the late 19th century. Right. And of course that poetry is uncannily relevant for our times. Right, right. So when my students read that poetry, they keep thinking this couldn't have been written over Right. over a hundred years ago. So often what I will do is read out some of those poems and we'll use the Twitter feed for students to comment on hmm. those poems. Right. So you can use it with quite yeah. humanistic material as well. Yeah. Let me ask you about another kind of education that you're involved in, which is really kind of like a public education. That's what struck me about that YouTube uh, mm -hmm. video, the one that's going viral now, that that's kind of has this really striking animated uh, p people have to see it to really get the idea of it. It looks like somebody's drawing a picture, but it, but it's really speeded up, so it it, it has kind of the virtue of uh, animation, but painting, and uh, in order to illustrate a very important point, and the idea is that welfare is not what we think of as just giving something to poor people, but actually there is all kinds of welfare in our society and we're, we're missing the whole point of trying to bring about an equitable society that's going to enrich all of us uh, by restricting these kind of categories. Right. But you do it in a kind of fun way, I have to admit. Even if you hated the topic, <laughs> you'd enjoy seeing right. the video. Now, most of us academics, we write for other academics, and we do our little journal articles and so forth, but here you've delivered, or we teach our courses, we've, we may deign to you know, speak down to our students, but you're, you're trying to embark on public education. Now, that's, that's a striking thing. Why'd you decide to do it? Uh, did you get flack from it, or, or people think it's a great idea, or what? I mean, I, to, to me, I think it's really intriguing, I think it's really important. But why, why, why did you get involved in this? These are the benefits of old age, right? That once, you, <laughs> once you reach a certain point in, in the academic hierarchies, you get to do what you want to do, right? That, you got uh, tenure, you can do anything. <laughs> you know, so I think I've been very fortunate mm -hmm. at Berkeley to be supported by wonderful units and programs within mm -hmm. Berkeley that have allowed well, the Blum me, Center, for example. The Blum Center mm -hmm. for Developing Economies mm -hmm. is at the top of that list, as well as the mm -hmm. College of Environmental Design, which is mm -hmm. my home college. Mm -hmm where my experiments with public scholarship have been um, greeted with, with great support. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I still do um, my academic research. I write a lot of pieces that will be read only by my academic colleagues, mm -hmm. and because I believe that that work is important, right. that certain theoretical interventions are important. Mm -hmm. And yet, in the work that we were doing on global poverty, particularly the work that related to the broad thinking on the topic, mm -hmm. I felt that it demanded a new format of public scholarship. So years ago, I'd shown a short video, um, an animated video, um, which featured uh, Zizek talking about, you know, in his usual brilliant, critical way, talking about capitalism and corporate social responsibility. And it, would, it had this live action sketching. 
and I showed it to my class and they loved it. And I thought, this is brilliant. In 10 minutes, this video conveyed what would have taken me perhaps an hour to teach, theoretically. Mm. Mm. And it was a different format. And by sheer coincidence, that semester in my class, there was this young undergraduate student mm. called Abby, mm. who it turned out is this amazing visual artist. She came to see me once in office hours. She was asking me questions about the class and I looked over at her notes and there weren't any words there, they were just drawings. Oh, wow. And I said, can I please see your notebook? <laughs> and so other students had told me about this artist. And she's the artist for these, the video. She's the artist. Oh, how interesting. She drew every one of my lectures as almost a graphic novel. Right. And I realized right then that we had videos to make. Ah. So Abby and I have been yeah. experimenting mm -hmm. with this genre where, you know, I, I, I sort of write a script, some of my colleagues write a script, and we wanted to do scripts that were amenable to the YouTube format, mm -hmm. 10 to 12 minutes, would be viewed widely. Open and, and why was it, was are you particularly kind of trying to get to the millennial generation who we're trying to get to the millennials we're mm. trying to get to young professionals who are broadly in the world of development practice mm. nonprofit work mm -hmm. who are interested i think in intellectual thinking mm -hmm. in critical thinking mm -hmm. but don't necessarily have the opportunity, say, to return to graduate school. To do mm -hmm. that, we'll do that later. And the idea was to combine critical social theory mm -hmm. with this sort of improv art with digital media. Mm -hmm. So we've tried to make our ideas accessible without necessarily diluting mm -hmm. the intellectual content. So, you know, there's still the John Kenneth Galbraith mm -hmm. in the video. And in others, you know, they, we still make our references to key intellectual texts. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to make these ideas travel and to ask some provocative questions. Well, it is a form of public education, but it also has policy implications. I mean, you can watch this video and, and you could end up saying, you know, darn, uh, we should, we should expand the minimum wage, for example. We should uh, take away the welfare from the rich and, and, uh, and change these stupid oil uh, subsidies and so forth. Right. These are political issues. Yes. Now, I'm sure there are people who are on the other side of these political issues. I tend to agree with your point of view, but, but it is a point of view. That's yes. the point. Absolutely. That's and, why they call Global Pov, by the way. Global poverty or global point of view videos. I see. Oh, Absolutely. the pop has a double That's meaning. Right. That's right. That's right. But aren't aren't you kind of open to the critique or the concern that you're moving into the realm of influencing policy, and rather than simply you know talking about education in a way that doesn't have any kind of of uh, influence on policy decisions? How do you respond to that? I think all of the research and teaching we do um, has a normative basis and has normative consequences. Mm -hmm. That I don't think there is value-free research mm -hmm. or value-free pedagogy. Mm -hmm. So in fact, what these videos do is precisely make explicit my point of view mm -hmm. and the values that shape this. I think what we try to do also, though, is is as part of the enterprise of critical thinking, is that instead of saying, here are the bad guys and here are the good guys, here are the really bad programs and here are the really good programs, to point out that this is complicated. And even the programs that we love or the social movements we love um, have their own particular limitations and shortcomings. Mm -hmm. What we point out, therefore, are that if you care about particular sorts of issues and if you want to achieve these following goals, then you might want to think about how you can ally with these particular sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So the video ends, for example, with the provocation that around the world there is, in fact, a renewed debate around guaranteed minimum incomes or the basic income grant. Mm -hmm. And indeed, after the video went viral, we've heard a lot from campaigns mm -hmm around the world that are fighting mm -hmm. for the basic income grant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is not just my work. Um, you know, this video is, is, is one tiny piece in what is a long-standing struggle, but it is to highlight, just train the spotlight, if you will, mm 
on that work that is already happening. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I think, as you point out, there is great affinity in, in the arguments being made by that video and the struggle in many cities and nationally in the U.S. around raising the minimum wage. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't mind if it has that kind of consequence. <laughs> but you can also say, well, that your intention is to put the spotlight on the, to analyze the problem. And if this is the policy implication, that's the policy implication. I think what we've resisted doing is to end each video with a to-do list for right. people. To say, here are the five things you must go out and do tomorrow. Right. Um, I know that some of my students would like that, right? <laughs> they want the solutions. Right. They're like, give us that blueprint. Right. And of course, um, I've resisted giving them the blueprint, but instead we've said, here are some possible venues of action. Mm -hmm. You want to think about this? Think more about this. Mm -hmm. Find out more. Mm -hmm. Learn more. So it's been very interesting for me to hear from graduate students um, and even some policymakers who want to find out more about conditional cash transfers mm -hmm. and how they work mm -hmm. and what their shortcomings are. Mm -hmm. So I think that what these videos can do and what we can do as educators at, in the UC system is precisely to spark these conversations mm -hmm. and these lines of debate, to open up the space for the debate. And you're grounded in the scholarship because, you know, you, you can kind of envision the specter of the Koch brothers coming in and putting a huge amount of money to some, some professor somewhere to produce really glossy kind of counter uh, videos to the ones that you produced. But your point is that you're not, you're, ba you're, you're, base, you're basing this in the scholarship of the analysis of the situation. And then it, yes, if it has policy implications, that's for the listener to decide. That's not what you, you didn't set about to create a policy impact kind of video. But you know, part of this is that I, my home department, as you know, is city planning. Mm -hmm. And many, many years ago, after I finished my undergraduate degree at Mills College, I chose urban planning mm -hmm. precisely okay. because I was interested always in linking knowledge to action. Mm -hmm. That I'm actually very comfortable thinking about the ways in which our ideas have impact on policy and have political implications. Mm -hmm. That I'm in a field that encourages us to think that through and take responsibility for it. So I think that in fact, um, that, that inevitably this sort of work sparks a particular amount of controversy, but I would hope that it also makes visible particular policy options and political possibilities that didn't seem to exist earlier, or didn't seem to be viable. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what I loved about um, the, the curation platform that posted this, um, and, and thus the video went viral, something called Upworthy, is that they, in fact, and they, they state this very clearly, they not only curate, they fact check. Mm -hmm. So they asked me for all my sources. Uh -huh. And when they posted the video, they posted the sources. And the sources were not just you know, what we know about Walmart right. or what we know right. about welfare in the US. Right. But they were also a, a quite broad spectrum of scholarly sources. Right, right. So I'm very intrigued by this idea that, in fact, they may have, in fact, read some of these scholarly pieces that I draw upon to make these arguments. And perhaps some of the people watching those videos will read that, too. And I take it you, you pass with flying colors. When they, well, that's they, why they posted it. Yes. They, <laughs> <laughs> they, they do quite a few weeks of fact-checking. Mm -hmm. And so I love that idea of rigorous scholarship that mm -hmm. can then provoke particular sorts of public debate. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, the video very clearly, most of it focuses on kind of our situation in, in America and Western countries and our ideas of welfare and, and the problem of, of uh, inec economic inequity in, in the United mm -hmm. States. But, the last part of it, you begin to talk about how this is done differently. So that's, that really excited me. I mean, this is now we're going global with this issue of, mm -hmm. of inequity. Mm -hmm. Not only just the inequity between countries, often that's the discussion when mm -hmm. we talk about global inequity, but the problem of inequity in other countries and how other countries are dealing with it. And you gave examples of India and Brazil and so forth. Could, could you elaborate a little on that? Because I think that's really interesting. We're not the only ones who had to think about this. No, I think, actually, I think in the US, I've always been struck mm -hmm. by the sharp difference between mm -hmm. how in US policy and popular debates, 
we frame the question of poverty, mm -hmm. often as, 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 as a problem of welfare dependency, often of the poor as unable to help themselves, as not being entrepreneurial or hardworking enough. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, Forbes ran an interesting critique of the video and called it agitprop, but presented an <laughs> argument. This is Forbes, Forbes magazine? This is Forbes magazine. Oh, they were critical of you. Well, then but, that's probably uh, maybe a good thing. For my yes, well, they made our point because, you know, they presented the American poor as sort of lazy mm -hmm. and, and uh, promiscuous. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, that's a very particular framing of poverty. Right. That's not the case everywhere else in the world. Well, first of all, it's not true. Well, it's not true, mm -hmm. but, but to me it's striking to see how national cultures, national political cultures frame the question I of see. poverty. And of course there's a long history to how and why that's the case in the US and the UK. Uh -huh. But I think the point on which we end the video is something that's the subject of my new research and a forthcoming book called Territories of Poverty, uh -huh. where we're trying to hold in simultaneous view the social histories of the welfare state in the North Atlantic and what we would call international development. Mm -hmm. uh, the ways in which the project of development has unfolded and has been undertaken, not just by larger development institutions like the World Bank, etc., but also by the developmental state. Well, could you give us some examples of how the issue of poverty is conceived differently and then approached differently in other parts of the world. So if we take Brazil, um, the part of the process of democratization in Brazil, I would argue was the creation of a new social contract mm -hmm. between the government and its poor citizens. Mm -hmm. And so in my field in urban planning, that took the form of the codification of something called the right to the city. Mm -hmm. First in the Brazilian Constitution and mm -hmm. then in the 2001 city statute. Mm -hmm. And what this has meant is to think through the place that the urban majority actually has in Brazilian cities. Right. It has been the process of democratizing the use of land, valuable land. Mm -hmm. It has been to think about um, the right to shelter. Mm -hmm. It has been to think about democratizing the urban planning process. Mm -hmm. Now these are very fragile rights and what's happening in a city like Rio de Janeiro, of course, is with the planning for the World Cup and, and the Olympics, right. mm -hmm. is that that right is greatly threatened. Yes, right. But nevertheless, but it's framed in terms of rights rather yes. than, uh, you know. It's framed in terms of rights. Uh, um, I think Brazil's whether. conditional <laughs> cash transfer program, Bolsa mm -hmm. Familia, which serves millions and mm -hmm. millions of poor households, mm -hmm. can also be understood as a part of that broader social contract. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, um, these are for the most part unconditional cash transfers. Mm -hmm. Brazil doesn't necessarily implement the conditions. Mm -hmm. And I think it is seen very much as a social debt mm -hmm. that the government owes mm -hmm. to its poor. Mm -hmm. That's a very different framing of poverty. And that's a shared point of view. That's kind of the common, are you saying that's kind of the common Brazilian way of looking at it? Not that, oh, we're giving money to these poor people who don't deserve it. That's right. But we have an obligation as a community to nourish all of and, and nurture all of our, our population. Is that the, the That is, and view? I think that what, what I'm arguing is that as we see the rise of the BRICS, Mm -hmm. Brazil, in Russia, India, China, South Africa, and there's a lot of talk about a new development bank right. led by the BRICS. I think that we are entering mm -hmm. a moment um, where the Bretton Woods order no longer holds. Mm -hmm. so the big actors in development are not, is, they're not going to be the World Bank mm -hmm. and the United Nations and IMF. It's going to be China. It's going to be the ways in which the BRICS reinvent the developmental state. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot there that continues what we've seen in the Bretton Woods order. Mm -hmm. There's a lot there that's going to deepen neoliberalization. But I think we're also beginning to see some very interesting experiments with human development and social protection mm. all through the Global South. Okay. Now, this is not happening because these governments are unusually benevolent. I'm, I argue in my work that it's happening because poor people's movements are demanding. Hmm. Well, let's take these India, problems. a country that both of us love and, and, and you know better than I, but is, would you say this is a good example? Well, India is an interesting example because um, I think India, as I pointed out, um, will have one of the world's um, 
Well, one of the largest concentrations of poverty in the world. So mm. the, 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 the geography of global poverty is shifting, as, as Andy Sumner and others have pointed out, so that earlier poverty was concentrated in low-income, what were often talked about as fragile nation states. That's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. The poverty, in fact, is concentrated in middle-income, democratically stable countries like India. Uh -huh. So India faces this great paradox of consistently high rates of economic growth. Yeah, now India has developed uh, one of the largest middle classes in the right? world. Political stability and yet high rates of poverty. Right. Right. So that's a paradox that the Indian government has to deal with. But what I think we've seen, particularly in the last five years or so, is an expansion of many of the social protection and entitlement programs hmm. um, that India has had typically for its rural populations, but now being expanded to reach its urban populations. Mm -hmm. And some of my new research is on these programs, particularly a new program in India dubbed Slum Free Cities. Mm -hmm. So not slum free because of slum demolitions, but really an attempt on <laughs> yes, the part- Yes, that was the old way to get rid of the slums. You That's just right. tear them down. <laughs> That's right. Drive these people and out. That continues. <laughs> yeah. But this new program, actually really pushed by activists in India, is an attempt to, um, to create property titles for slum dwellers, mm -hmm. to create the first legal recognition for slum dwellers, and to think about social protection programs. Mm -hmm. Now again, I don't want to romanticize these programs. Right. What I am suggesting is that there's a political opening here, there's mm -hmm. a shift, mm -hmm. that as researchers we need to be attentive to these new moments. Mm -hmm. We need to think about what sort of developmental state is in the making, mm -hmm. and the policies side of me is very interested right, right. Is in how we can make these policies more progressive. Yeah, and this is something that's been going on in India for a long time. Uh, I, I did my graduate dissertation on a group called the Untouchables uh, mm -hmm. in northern India in the mm -hmm. Punjab. Uh, the, the, we call them Untouchables, the castes, the lowest castes, or often um, Laborers, they're landless laborers in the fields, or are the sweepers, the people who right. deal with garbage and, and, and leather in, in, the, in the cities. Uh, but the British put them on a schedule, or schedule, as they yes. and the Indians say. Uh, so they're really m more commonly known as the schedule caste mm -hmm. uh, in India today, because the, in the, sh the schedule, or schedule, uh, was interesting because it was a schedule of those people of, of the caste that, that deserved special uh, kinds of benefits. Mm -hmm. And those benef benefits were not just economic, they were also political mm -hmm. and social. So there would be a certain number of positions set aside within uh, government or, or within the university, or, or even positions in, in parliament. Mm -hmm. So a certain number of positions mm -hmm. set aside, that only in people of the schedule cast right. can run in this. Now that's a very dramatic, Thing. Can you, um, this has been going on for India for, you know, for most of uh, 100 years. Can you imagine that kind of model working or being even appreciated or understood? I mean, what if this was proposed in the United States? We also should have a certain percentage of seats reserved because there's too many millionaires in Congress. So we should have a certain number of seats reserved for people who make under, you know, $40,000 a year. Well, for a while we called it affirmative action. Yes. Right. It is a kind of affirmative. So I think this whole question of how <clears throat> do we make reparations for past exploitations and dispossessions mm -hmm. is an interesting one because that's really what India tried to address by mm. thinking about quotas for the scheduled castes. Right. It's a, it, one can think about it as a particular set of reparations. Mm -hmm. um, and one can think about affirmative action in that light as well. But it returns me then to how we think about these issues and goes back to your opening question of me, that how does the question of poverty affect all of us rather than right. it's the poor. So I like to think increasingly about the issue of poverty and inequality, um, particularly if we think about it in these historicized ways mm -hmm. as a civil rights issue. Mm -hmm. And some of my new research has also been on the 1960s in, 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 in America. I've been trying to make sense of the city that I've now lived in for so long, Oakland, mm -hmm. and thinking about Oakland and the rise of the Black Panther Party, but thinking about the civil rights movement and the ways in which it shaped the war on poverty here in the US right. in the 60s. 
And I'm very interested in what it would mean for us to think then about poverty and inequality as a civil rights issue. Mm -hmm. And how then do we express solidarity with the social movements that take this up as a civil rights issue, but how do we then make our institutions more just mm -hmm. to take into consideration mm -hmm. the civil rights exclusions and exploitations that have happened. Right. That this is, so I see the question, my <clears throat> broadest interest in global poverty, aside from my research interest, mm -hmm. is perhaps this sense of the unfinished work of the struggles of the 20th century. Hmm. That I wasn't alive during the, the great freedom movements that won independence for countries like India. But there's unfinished work there. Mm -hmm. Last year when I went to South Africa, I was very much reminded of how for my generation when we were in college, the big issue was the struggle against apartheid. That right. was our issue. Mm -hmm. um, and yet being in South Africa, I was very much reminded of the unfinished work mm -hmm of the anti-apartheid movement. Hmm. So I see the the, the, the the struggle against poverty and inequality and the reason why it's all our, it's, it, it's an issue that affects us all is that it is a civil rights issue. Right. It is that unfinished work of the civil rights movements mm -hmm. of the late 20th century. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's very well put and it's one that, 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 that all can be involved in. You know, my dissertation actually focused on a social movement. And it was a social movement of untouchables themselves, of yes. Shedro caste. Yes. And and it was it was a movement for equality, but in order obviously economic equality was a okay. huge issue. But it was a movement first of all for political and cultural equality. Yes. So, and, and in order to politically mobilized, what they did was something that may seem startling to us, create a new religion. Hmm. And the religion was called Ad Dharma, which means the original religion. Yes. And they claimed that the problem is that we're oppressed by these Hindus, that yes. by people who conceive yes. of us, they're very, it's the thought structure, oh, well, the poor, they're right. a different right. kind of people. That's right. So they, they said, before you can have political and economic equality, you have to change minds about the nature of society. And in India, that means yes. changing the the way in which we think about the relationship of religion in society. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a, move, a huge movement. Yeah. It had political influence and it, it still does in Punjab. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a major mm -hmm. political uh, mm -hmm. as well as social force. But is this the kind of thing that you envision that, that maybe needs to be reignited, uh, not only in India, but in other parts of the world? I think poor people's mm -hmm. movements around the world have been doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in the, in the video I mentioned the work of Saul Alinsky mm -hmm. who working in, in poor neighborhoods in Chicago in the 50s and 60s repeatedly talked about how the issue was not the poverty of money, it was mm -hmm. the poverty of power mm -hmm. and what it meant for community action programs to redefine um, the strength and vitality of those communities. Mm -hmm. I think that in addition to this um, there's also, I keep going back to this idea of solidarity because one, you know, when, when we face those big budget cuts in the UC system, this was very much on my mind, that, that the threatened middle classes of America, mm -hmm. right, those facing those incredible foreclosures, mm -hmm. seeing household debt balloon, student debt balloon, uh, facing uncertain employment, that the threatened middle classes might in fact be able to think about new forms of solidarity with those who have been historically economically vulnerable. Mm -hmm. right? They have a united front in a sense, not just fight for their own you know, diminishing uh, rights and roles. That's right, like, uh, that's right. And I think we're seeing this in parts of Europe. I've graduate students doing research in places like Spain. Mm -hmm. And I think that those movements mm -hmm. Uh, that have emerged out of economic crisis are those that cut across traditional social class lines, mm -hmm. right? That are more mm -hmm. broad-based solidarity right. movements. And, you know, for a moment, I think that's what the Occupy movement sparked as right. a common sense in this country. Mm -hmm. That brilliant idea that we are the 99% mm -hmm. and how true it is. Mm -hmm. In some ways, we are the 99%. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think... And it was generally a global movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, mm -hmm. in addition to the, the reframing the poor people's movements inevitably do, that poverty is not seen as, as, um, as delinquency, it is not seen as, as a shortcoming, but is seen as a relationship of impoverishment. Right. 
I think there is also this interesting work of solidarity that is possible at moments like this where the world is being rearranged. There is sustained economic crisis at the heart of what seem to be once the world's most powerful economies. Right, right. And other parts of the world are enjoying new forms of prosperity and yet seeing persistent inequality. But, but how can you be optimistic? I mean, it, let, let's look at the future. Uh, and right now the trend seems to be just the opposite in terms of, of uh, equity and, and mm -hmm. of economic justice. Uh, in this country, there's never been, a, a, in recent years, a higher right. degree of inequity, a uh, loss of, of power and, and status of the middle, middle class. Around the world, the whole transnational character of, of the ec economy and, and the profusion of sweatshops uh, mm -hmm. throughout the, as a part of a stable part of, integral part of the global economy. Uh, how can you, how can you be optimistic about the future? <laughs> I'm usually not optimistic. And so um, I think that in many ways my research is, is, uh, doesn't give, give us much grounds for optimism. And yet I'm optimistic because I do think that there continues to be the making of a, a new common sense around these issues. That yes, Inequality is at a historic high in the US. We thought that that historic high would be 2007, when the numbers looked a lot like 1928. Mm -hmm. It turns out that, that it's even worse now, mm. as, as the gains from the recovery from, from the Great Recession have flowed primarily to not only the top 1%, with the 0.01 percent, mm. right? I mean, these are obscene levels of inequality, and they're not natural. They've been produced mm -hmm. systematically through policies. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that there is also a common sense, or the emergence of a common sense around this. That there's this is the matter of debate. That there's an outrage. Mm -hmm. That outrage may not always take the form of collective action. It may not take the form of the policy changes we would want to see. Mm. But nevertheless, it's present. So I guess I'm, co I'm optimistic because I'm contrasting this mm. with the lived experience of the 1980s and early 1990s. Mm -hmm. When, if for lack of a better term, we were to call it neoliberalism, mm -hmm. when neoliberalism felt so entrenched, when there truly seemed no alternative way of thinking. Mm -hmm. It was the common sense. It mm -hmm. was the truth. It was the Washington consensus. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced. Mm. that that is the case, or can be the case ever again. Anand Roy, I've learned so much from you today, and in your own way, you're very inspiring. I can see why you're such an extraordinary teacher. Uh, you've taught us all. Thank you so much for uh, this conversation. Thank you, this was wonderful. Great.